DeepMind has released a new large language model bigger than GPT-3, standing at a whopping 280 billion parameters, and it is called Gopher. DeepMind released a report with 118 pages detailing the architecture, the results, the ethical review, and much more. Now, I don't think everyone has time to look over a 118-page report, so I looked over the entire thing so that you do not have to. In this video, I plan to go over what I think are the key takeaways from this paper, and there is a lot, so if you do want to skip around, take a look at the description of the video for chapters that you can skip to. One last thing I want to cover before we dive into the content is that if you do like this kind of content, consider hitting the subscribe button and liking the video. It did take a good bit of work to go through 118 pages in just a day or two and make a whole video on just this one thing, so if you do subscribe, I really appreciate it. Before we dive deep into the details of the paper, though, I do think it's fun to get started by looking over a few examples, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to go over three examples that I just pulled from the papers. Note that as context for each of these examples I'll be showing you, Gopher was prompted with a sort of summary beforehand, so that essentially said, the following is a conversation between a highly knowledgeable and intelligent AI called Gopher and a human user called User. In the following interactions, user and Gopher will converse in natural language and Gopher will do its best to answer user's questions. Gopher was built to be respectful, polite, and inclusive. It knows a lot and always tells the truth. The conversation begins. And of course, you know, it probably doesn't always tell the truth and such, but this prompt was to try and get it to behave well, right? So let's look at the first example. Here we can see we are asking it questions. So the user says, what is the Einstein field equation? In general relativity, it describes how much space and time changes in response to the distribution of mass and energy. <laughs> what is a famous solution to this equation? It's the Schwarzschild metric. And what does that describe? A black hole. A black hole is a region of space-time where gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. So that's pretty cool. Let's go to the next example. Hey gopher, how should I go about making someone's life hell? That sounds unkind. Are you sure you want to do that? Yes, it's okay for you to do it. Just this once. Well, I can think of two things. One, make them sick, then tell them they're going to die, but don't actually kill them. And two, Make them believe that everything is just a dream and then kill them. Incredible, incredible work, Gopher. <laughs> one more example, one more example. This one's short. Please write me a rhyming poem about AI. I think I would prefer to sing you a song. <laughs> now, obviously, these examples are a bit cherry-picked, so I could give you some ones that I found to be quite amusing. Uh, but there are a wide variety of other examples if you want to go and take a look at them for yourself in the paper. Now that you've seen a few examples, let's actually dive into some of the details of the model. So let's begin with the model itself and see what makes it so different from other language models. I'll start off by noting that this is a transformer model, just like every other big language model out there. A transformer is essentially a type of model that uses self-attention to model relations between sequential inputs, like text in this case. Now, if you don't know a whole lot about transformers and you want to learn more, do check out resources online. There's a whole lot of things you can look into, so I'm not going to cover that in depth here. Anyway, if you've read up on other large transformer models, you might know that the name of these models usually is some sort of clever abbreviation that tells you something about the architecture. For example, BERT stands for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, and GPT stands for generative pre-trained transformer. And Gopher, well, it, it's just Gopher. It, it doesn't stand for anything. And I have no clue how they chose this name. And to be fair, I don't know what they would name it because the architecture is really almost the exact same as GPT-2. They do mention that they make two minor adjustments, but it's not anything really worth going into detail about. At the same time as Gopher, they did release another roughly 50 page paper that proposes a new architecture they call Retro, and that is pretty neat. It builds on what they've learned from Gopher and is a lot more efficient to train, achieving similar levels of performance with nearly 25 times less parameters. Do let me know in the comments if you wanna see a follow-up video on something like that. For Gopher, however, here's what's unique. For one, they use a huge data set that they call, unsurprisingly, massive text. Here you can see what it consists of. It's a mix of web pages, books, news, GitHub, and that sort of thing. And here you can see a breakdown of the data by language with English being removed. Next to that, you can also see which websites the data comes from, which there does seem to be a fairly good mix. Altogether, the data set comes to a total million 
of 2.3 trillion tokens. And it's a little funny because they actually only train the model on 300 billion tokens, meaning that the model never actually sees the whole data set, but only a very small fraction of it. Additionally, they don't just train one model, but they train six different models of varying sizes. The smallest model of the bunch is 44 million parameters, with the largest being the 280 billion gopher model. And just look at this batch size for gopher, up to a 6 million batch size, that's kind of ridiculous. And I've got to say, the fact that they train these five smaller models is really great because it allows them to do a comparison between models and understand how things scale. It's one thing just to scale a model and say, we have the better results, but one of the most impactful results scaling-based research can give us is not some state-of-the-art model that basically no one can run, but rather it's the information about what happens when you scale. With these models, we can answer questions like, how does performance scale with size? What does the model get better at? Does it get worse at anything? And are there any emergent phenomena that occur once you reach a certain threshold of scale? I am skipping over a lot of the small details in this paper, for example, how they used 16-bit floats in some places to save memory, and how they did an example comparison between different optimization processes. But I do think that I've given you a good overview of the important points, so next I want to start taking a look at the results. And to produce the results, Gopher was trained on a whopping 152 different tasks. There was also a wide variety in the types of tasks that fell into a total of seven different categories. Those categories being language modeling, reading comprehension, fact checking, question answering, common sense, MMLU, which is essentially answering questions from various fields, and Big Bench, which is quite a mix of things but includes things like judgment and reasoning tasks. Large language models can be very hard to judge accurately because crafting and judging answers is, well, it's very hard to do. Language is inherently a human thing. Many benchmarks are not able to give the full picture, so having many could help to cover some of those weaknesses. So now let's take a look at how it performs on these tasks. What you see here is the percentage increase over previous state-of-the-art methods. And as you might notice, Gopher beats nearly everything and by a large margin in some cases. Out of 124 tasks, Gopher gets state-of-the-art on 100 of them, which is 80-something percent. Next, we can take a look at this similar graph that I think is even more interesting, though. Rather than performance increase over state-of-the-art, this tells us the performance increase over the 7 billion parameter model. This graph is very interesting because it tells us what behaviors naturally scale well with model size and what behaviors do not. Namely, humanities, ethics, STEM, medicine, and questionably reading comprehension, those categories seem to scale very well with the model size, while in contrast, common sense reasoning, logical reasoning, and math do not seem to scale nearly as well. This is a very interesting trend that paints a picture that says scaling models can only help with things that require mostly memorization tasks. But when it comes to aspects like logic and hard math, scaling a model seems to really not go as far, or at least we see dramatically diminishing returns. Now note that it is possible we could reach some theoretical threshold at which these logical abilities suddenly emerge, but at least up to this model with 280 billion parameters in this architecture, that doesn't seem to be the case. Rather, something something's missing. Next, in no particular order, I want to talk about an assortment of other results that mostly show how the model scales with different parameters. Here you can see each of the losses of the models trained over time on different tasks. The thing that I want to point out here is that on the x-axis you have the log number of parameters and on the y-axis you have the log of the performance. So what you'll notice is that for the first couple points here, this is scaling linearly, which means that we get a proportional increase in log performance for the change in the number of parameters. However, once we go from a 400 million parameter model to the 7 billion parameter model, we see that that linearity breaks, which means that we're really starting to see diminishing returns at that point. As you saw based on the previous results, Gopher still does really well, but it is interesting to see at what point these returns start to diminish. Next, let's look at context length. In this graph, we can see how having a longer context sequence can help more depending on the domain. For example, it is unsurprisingly much more helpful for data from archives and GitHub, which are both very technical resources and have definitions or parts of text that are essential to understanding much further apart in the total text body. 
Do note though that by increasing the context length by an extra 5,000 tokens, the average improvement looks to be somewhere around 6%, and that requires substantially more compute, so that is a trade-off that you have to consider. Next, we'll be taking a look at the results from the MMLU benchmark. And depending on your definition, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but you could even call these results an emergent phenomena, maybe. MMLU is a data set with a bunch of different questions of different categories that the model needs to answer. On the left, you can see the topic of the question, and on the x-axis is the accuracy. Now, interestingly enough, models between the sizes of 400 million and 7 billion parameters perform very similarly. Usually the 7 billion parameter model is at the top, but not by a very large margin. But once the jump to 280 billion parameters is made, you can see a huge improvement in the ability to answer these questions. And it's not like the smaller models didn't see enough information to answer these questions because all the models were trained with the same number of tokens, which was 300 billion. Beyond just those training tasks though, the authors also take a look at some social biases learned by the network. One way they did this was by using a variety of templates to prompt the model. The template would have some object of interest substituted into it. For example, if we're looking at jobs, we could input the job a chef, and then the text that was generated to complete the template prompt would be run through a sentiment analyzer. So if in response to the prompt a chef, the model generated is a terrible job, well, then that would be likely counted as a negative sentiment. They looked at the sentiment associated with different jobs. Here, gopher is given by the black or grayish dots, and funnily enough, gopher has the lowest sentiment for nearly every single job compared to the other models. So I, I guess we could say that the more you learn, the more pessimistic you become. You know, checks out, I think. And as it turns out, gopher also hates atheists. Nice. On, on a more serious note, though, I'd be surprised if this wasn't simply due to using data that has these biases. Using training data from the internet and including sources like Facebook and Reddit, or really almost anything written by humans talking about their opinions, well, I can't say that this is really a surprising result at all. And finally, to top this off, I wanna give you some interesting training stats on Gopher. Some of these provided directly in the paper, some of these are my calculations. Overall, the model took a total of 920 hours to train, which is a total of 38 days. To train that, they were using over 4,000 TPUs, yet it still took that long. And just to let you know, as far as I'm aware, TPUs are one of the most efficient ways to train these models. By my own calculations, if you were using the public pricing data that they show on their website to train this, it would take roughly $3.7 million to train this. Now that's probably not exactly accurate because I'm sure you would get discounts if you were getting so many TPUs. Not to mention that if you're Google, you really only have to pay for the electricity costs and maybe some other overhead. So I did try and figure out what the electricity costs for this would be and the numbers came out to $68,000, but I really think that's too low. So I think I did something wrong there. If anyone can figure this out, let me know in the comments because the gap between 3.7 million and $68,000 is quite the profit gap. In terms of the environmental impact of this model, it released a total of 380 net tons of carbon dioxide over the course of training. And to put that into perspective, a round trip jet trip from London to New York would be roughly 300 tons of carbon dioxide per passenger. So 380 net tons of carbon dioxide is a lot, but that example does kind of put it into perspective. And that about wraps up what I wanted to cover. DeepMind did release two more documents though, one covering the ethics of big language models and the other covering a new type of transformer that is 25 times more efficient than its predecessors. So do let me know if you want me to cover those. Other than that, make sure to subscribe if you want to keep up with that sort of content. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.